This is the Lydian spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and occasionally there might be a snarky remark from our producer, Simon Slater. This is episode number 87. <laughs> I'm really, you know, Tim, I am kind of a bit of a numbers freak. Sure. You know? Now, that is not my system in music. I'm just saying one, two, three, four. Okay. Since February 24th, there have been more than 20,000 earthquakes in Iceland. 20,000. Tw- yes. Now, okay. okay. <laughs> Iceland, it, it is a constant earthquake zone because it sits on both the Eurasian and the North American tectonic plates. And it's really the only place that you could actually see the plates. Now, huh. I don't know where you have to stand, but they're waiting for another big blow, another big another big volcano. Right. And I remember in 2010. Oh, yeah. That volcano that threw most of Europe into chaos. I remember it because I was touring with Big Sexy Noise and we got shimmy shammed out of a few dates. Yeah, I think that's when uh, General, was it McChrystal had to resign because he was stuck in Paris <laughs> and he got drunk at, at some hotel and, and the uh, Rolling Stone journalist was there. And basically he started running his mouth and dissing obama and then he had to resign so yeah <laughs> well i we had a better time uh but we were in france and the thing is of course you couldn't go anywhere i remember at one point we're on a ferry could only take a ferry somewhere but the Jesus. volcano that blew then in 2010 was i mean for a month it disturbed oh, travel yeah. all over europe but oh. i mean twenty thousand. i don't care if they're minis I, I mean february 24th it's 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 pretty cataclysmic Earthquakes are always they're so mysterious to me. I mean, I guess there because there was a big earthquake in Japan the other like last week. Or yes, something. terrifying. Yes, it was a something like a twelve year later aftershock of Fukushima. Like, like I didn't even know aftershocks could take that many. And how do they even know? Now, did you know that? I mean, first of all, you know, animals know when earthquakes are coming. I've they, heard they, that they I've do. Well, that. they feel they they feel the vibration. But did you know that I like to consider my left ass cheek, kind of an earthquake detector. Okay, explain. Well, I'm just saying that I've been in a few earthquakes before. I did live in L.A. twice, but even in Barcelona once, I felt an earthquake and I was trying to convince the person I'm sitting in my kitchen with. I'm like, uh, I just felt an earthquake on my left ass cheek. They're like, no, you didn't. I'm like, excuse me, check the paper. And yes, indeed. Now, in L.A., when I experienced an earthquake in, in the middle of the night, it's when they usually happen. I don't know why. Yeah, it's <laughs> scary more. But I had such little fear that I just got up, put my standing mirror on the floor, went back okay. into bed and said, whatever happens, uh, happens. Okay. You know, I, I, the biggest earthquake I was in, I didn't feel. I, I, was, I was walking around in um, San Francisco and everyone well, like, oh, you didn't, uh, Tim, it's because you didn't have your hand on my left that's Carry true on. that is true I, mean, I, I was walking through chinatown in, in san francisco and i i supposedly when you when you're walking sometimes you don't feel it I, I i don't know but but i did feel the one that was in new york city a few years ago that was like a really miniature one like four point something i was at the beach i was swimming and i went back to the sand kind of drying off and i was like i think i just felt an earthquake and there was these people, a couple of towels over. I go, I think that was an earthquake. They're like, no way. Uh. And then sure enough, it happened again. And, and uh, yes, it was. I was basically like, if suddenly the ocean starts disappearing, sort of like that tsunami, like, because that's what happens. Like, it, it starts disappearing. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you have this giant wall coming at you. I was like, I'm out of here. But uh, fortunately, Tim, that didn't happen. Tim, would you want to surf a tsunami? Well, it's funny you say that. I mean, there, you know, tsunamis aren't like a, a really a surfable wave. They're, they're, they're not, they don't break. It's just basically like the tide going up really fast and really high. It's not like a breaking wave. No, I don't think anyone wants to try that one. Although there, there was a guy in Japan, I think like in the 70s, that tied himself to like a pole and he had like underwater camera stuff. He like broke all his bones, but he wanted to like film being in a tsunami. <laughs> Anyhow, that's pretty ridiculous. Brave men are hard to come by at this point. So let's just say, do it, do what you do. I, I mean, what's a, what's a couple of broken bones between <laughs> friends? <laughs> uh, I was at Puffy's outdoors in um, in Tribe in Tribeca. Well, what's interesting is Adele and I were. We, we had been interviewing Adele Berté for a yes. coming podcast. 
we were talking about that Adele and I used to go there to dance to the jukebox. And then that was Monday. And then you come over last night and say, you were at Puffy's. I was at Puffy's. I was hanging hanging with Shelly Hirsch. We're having some drinks outside. It was a beautiful day. And a very nice bartender, uh, Brendan, gave hooked hooked me up. But geez, uh, I'm, I'm kind of feeling a little bit today. But speaking of drinks, Bowling Green State University frat boy. Oh, I love this. It's horrible. In one of these alcohol hazing uh, things, uh, drag himself to death for the fraternity Pi Kappa Alpha. <laughs> That's so, so dumb. But uh, these these roof, the roommates are like, ah, he's in dire condition. You got to come and get him. I guess the pledging brothers, I, I guess they were instructed to drink 40 shots, 40 shots. I mean, that is just reckless and I mean, insane. I mean, look, do you expect college <laughs> boys to be intelligent? No. Hello. Oh, my now, God. Speaking about stupidity on a mass scale. Yes. Texas. OK. Not everyone there. Are... <laughs> not everyone there. But however, you know, they just decided no mask mandate. They decided that at the same time that. Houston warns of uncontrolled spread of UK super COVID after it was found in 80 percent of the sewage a week before the governor lifted the face mask mandate. Now, it's the highly contagious UK variant and rapidly spreading throughout Houston, Texas. And, and, And this was Monday that the Houston Health Department revealed that the variant B117, there's those numbers again, that. They found it at more than three quarters of the city's wastewater plans and samples collected since February 22nd. Yeah, Texas is really showing its true colors these days. And then at the same time, we have not only spring break, you fucking idiots, (laughs) right as COVID is going down. And we also have the Daytona Beach bike run with hundreds of thousands of maskless marauders defiant yes now uh, tim yes question other than mentally have you ever known me to be sick i i've never seen you with a cold or any of that how how long have we been working together uh we have eight yeah eight years now all right well i have to say i did and this was under your encouragement you said a lot of you Sign up for the vaccine. And I have to say, I'm getting a vaccine shot. Now, look, I've never had a flu vaccine because I never get the flu. I never get sick. I never get a cold. If I'm going to have something, it's going to be catastrophic. I've learned to deal with it or it's just going to be pain. I'm getting a vax on Friday, conveniently located two blocks from my house. Wow, that's very convenient. We don't know. But I mean, I feel that we've all been the people that we know, at least mostly have been pretty lucky. I was not happy when I found out that my favorite laundry delivery man's mother, who happens to be from Naples, is in the hospital with COVID. Ooh, ooh. I, I asked you, we consulted. You said get the vaccine. I trust your judgment. I love needles. Not that I've ever really used them. <laughs> Usually I prefer using them on other people. I'm not oh afraid boy. of needles. I've never had a vaccine for anything unless, you know, from a child. We have to blindly run dumbly into the needle at this point. We'll see if you get the Johnson and Johnson one shotter or if you can get the two, the two shot one. But, I think uh, they should give me a shot in my Johnson, but I'd have to use yours because <laughs> I don't have one. Now, carry oh, on. Oh, my Timmons. gosh. All right. So um, going back to the state of Texas, specifically the town Wolf Forth, Texas, sorry. A man decided he, he took one of the car dealership loaner cars drove it to a bank to rob the bank and then use that cash to go back to the dealership to make a down payment on a brand new BMW. 50 year old man, Eric Dion Warren went into the bank with a fast food restaurant bag and a note, which said, this is a fucking robbery. Play with me and die. (laughs) (laughs) I I want $10,000 in fifties and hundred dollar bills. Now you got one minute or I'll kill you. <laughs> I, I, I want a t sh- I want a t shirt that says play with me or you'll die. <laughs> or you'll die. So then he pulled out the gun and then he said, I ain't playing around. And only a hundreds and fifties. And so then he drove back to the uh, dealership and was literally before he even went to the um, finance office, was parading around the showroom waving chunks of cash in his fists, like, I got it, I got it. 
And then he went to go make a $3,000 down payment, at which point, because <laughs> the bank just down the road, all, like, all, all the all the uh, workers at the dealership are like, we're looking for a guy that looks like this. And then they're like, I think he's, this is him. Uh, so then they called the cops and he got arrested. And now he's going to be facing 20, uh, that's a little much, 20 ouch. years in prison. Ouch. Oh, yeah. Big, ouch. Big mistake, Eric Dion Warren. Another ch- turned out to be a pretty dumb choice. Burger King UK is a. Po- <laughs> <laughs> they're apologizing because on Wim- International Women's Day, which was the like just the other day. Tim, right? <laughs> hold, hold up, right there. <laughs> what day is it at my house every day? International Women's Day. Carry yeah, on. Sure. Well, uh, all right. Their their official Burger King UK Twitter <laughs> account tweeted. <laughs> Women belong in the kitchen. <laughs> All right, I, I, I'm going to back that up. I'm going to back that up for a minute. You know where women belong in the kitchen with butcher knives, carving knives, fire, and an apron on their boyfriend, husband, twerks ass as he's bending over cooking me stuff. <laughs> Whatever it is, I want that. Night. Well, it, it turns out it wasn't like someone hacking. It was, they're trying to be clever because they're like. Unfortunately, only 20% of restaurants, chefs are women, and we're going to uh, try to balance our, um, you know, make it more fair and, and hire more women employees and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the damage was done because before they did the follow up, just everyone started going nuts. As I always like to say when people ask me, Lydia, do you have any advice for would be young musicians? And I'm going to say this also to women that might be thinking about a life as a chef or a cook. We need doctors, <laughs> architects, chemists. We need women to do something very useful, not just follow men in their pathetic footsteps into the fucking kitchen. Oh, we want to be in a hot fucking kitchen cooking for hundreds of people a fucking day. What are you nuts? Look, it's bad enough when you have to cook for one <laughs> asshole and maybe a kid or two. Get the fuck out of here. You know what? How about some takeaway? And I don't mean Burger King. I'm just saying now. <laughs> well, the Times of London business section, of course, they made commentary that they're like, the idea was there, but the, the execution. Was As terrible. I like to say, good <laughs> idea, poor execution. Now. A group of, and I have to say, I really do love the word hackers, but maybe that's, I just interpret it differently. A group of hackers say they breached a massive trove of security camera data collected by Silicon Valley startup Verkata Inc. Gaining okay. access to live feeds of 150,000 surveillance cameras inside hospitals, companies, police departments, prisons, and schools. Now, Tim, we've really yes. never discussed porno. We, we've talked a, a little bit about like not on the air. I'm oh, just not on the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I do love surveillance footage. I'm just saying. So companies whose footage was exposed include Tesla, software provider Cloudflare. In addition, hackers were also able to view video from inside women's health clinics, psychiatric oh, hospitals. And the offices of Verkada itself. Some of the cameras, including in hospitals, use facial recognition technology to identify, categorize people. And the hackers say they have uh, full access to the video archive of the Verkada customers. Now, the data breach was carried out by an international hacker. I mean, just I I don't know why it turns Mm -hmm. me on international hacker collective (laughs) and intended to show the pervasiveness of video surveillance and the ease with which systems can be broken into. You know what, Tim? What? Bring your eyes to my house. And you do anytime you want. And trust me, when there's too much for even your eyes to see, (laughs) that's when I put the blindfolds on you. (laughs) Well, I, you know, I I, I like to look. I like to look. I'm sorry. Uh, Tim, I'm a bit frisky. I like to be looked at. You know me. Uh, Are you, I know we, look, we, we're going to admit this. Timmy, tie it up. Yeah. And I had a rather long night last night. But then again, life is short. Nights should be long. I'm feeling pretty good right now. I was feeling pretty rough. A little morning, rough. But yeah, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing fine now. Well, uh, look, the, what, the morning, meaning when you left my house at 4 a.m.? Or uh, the yeah, morning well, when you woke up at 11 a.m.? 
I, I think we'll have a 10 30. It was, it was whatever. Uh, doesn't matter. Doesn't I'm matter. feeling fine now. I'm feeling um, fine. Yeah, so you know, you know, I mean, this is nothing compared to touring. You know, just get well, this is the it. problem, isn't it? Hey, Tim, yes. should we just tour my neighborhood and like pretend? Whatever. It's probably sure. Coming around, coming around the bend. Hey, Sally, go around the roses. Timmy, tie it up. What you got for me? What's the last thing on your mind? Oh uh, well, I got a couple more. So the right wing. I'll throw right, them out. Right, right wing activist. That guy, Milo Yiannopoulos, is that how you say his name? They, you know what? I don't say his fucking name, but carry on. He's now officially, quote unquote, ex-gay after going to conversion therapy and dedicating himself to Jesus. He says he's officially uh, it, he's officially so ex-gay he, he, and he's <laughs> even dumber than he even dumber than he was before. But he's uh, he's ex-gay and he's now officially sodomy free. Oh, um, I yeah. cannot think of a worse fate. <laughs> Start to be free. What kind yeah. of existence is that? I don't know. For this a guy. man. Yeah, For I a don't man. Know. He claims he was mostly gay back in the day to torment his mom. Uh, whatever. All right, that's a dumb story. All right, here's a story that's kind of interesting. New Jersey. Well, I'm a... not sure I'm done with okay. Go talking about the... sodomites at the <laughs> moment. Right. Okay. Look, I respect any man that can admit, and most of them, it is a dirty little secret, do need, do want, do need, should have something shoved up their fucking rectum every now and then <laughs> just to level the playing field. That's just another confusion. All right, carry on. Tim. I mean, well, te technically a blowjob sodomy, too, by the official definition. Anything that's well, not you know what? penis if, of vagina sex. Is I have to like say, sodomy. probably if I was blowing you, you would think I was fisting your fucking ass. I'm just, <laughs> oh, God. That's not a good night. Okay, all right. That's not a good night. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so. Look, you brought this out in me, motherfucker. You're the one that kept me up till 4 a.m., oh, and this is what God. you get. Well, you, want you know. Uh, Tim. You know what? You're one of the only men that can actually handle this. So I guess you do. Yeah, want sure. I mean, Carry I guess on, Skippy st st staying up could mean many things. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, if you don't stay up, I'm going to stick something up there. I'm going to oh, see how far up Lord. the nothing. <laughs> oh you know, your Lord won't save you at that point because it's going to be Satan <laughs> all the way. All right. Tie uh, it up. Uh, uh, wait, hold on. So this New Jersey guy, uh, <laughs> Andrew Fioli of 40 who went missing during a snow blizzard back in January. Like, they're like, where is this guy? Well, now that it's warm, these giant snow banks are melting and they found his corpse. And I guess he's just, yeah, he was, he fell down or he, you know, you know, my brother went to school in, in Minneapolis and, and or St. Paul, Minnesota. He said that happened all the time because it's so cold there. Someone comes back from the bar. They're, they're drunk. They don't have their keys. They can't find them. So they just like sit in the front step, try to figure it out. And they fall asleep. And, and they die. Thing, yeah. Well, they're like a statue like Jack Nicholson at the end of the, the Shining. He's just kind of uh, like, God. Oh. All right. So I'll tie it up with, with an animal story. Actually, this one you sent me. The body of an eight year old <laughs> boy was cut out. Oh, my out. God. I mean, can you? Okay. Can you? <laughs> I would have loved. I have to say, I would have. Love to have been there. I would have given a little tiny tot mouth to mouth because I'm generous. Well, tell, tell me the story, Tim. Yeah. So, so uh, eight year old boy in Indonesia was fishing with his dad when a 26 foot fucking crocodile. That's a big one. Basically just snatched the kid and uh, swallowed him whole. I mean, I mean, the, the dad was trying to fight the thing, but that thing was he had no chance. Most of you probably know, but for those who don't know, the crocodiles and, <laughs> and alligators, they don't like like they're not like a shark. They don't just like rip you to shreds. They drown you. Swallow you. They, they swallow twist you around as well. So they caught the, the crocodile and they killed it. And they, they cut him open and it was like basically no bite marks. He was just swallowed whole. He just like sucked the kid down. Some people, that's a fetish concept to them. Now, Tim, it's amazing to me we're going to end with that tale because last uh -huh. night, if you if you recall, <laughs> yes. I told oh, no. you okay. that I revealed to you something that you might not have known about me before is that I do like, and I even offered to go with your brother and you, preferably just your brother because we leave you at the shore because you're not that interested. <laughs> I'll go. In, in fishing. Now, the only reason I say that is because, first of all, I already... I'm meditative. I'm, but the only thing I've ever caught fishing is eels and a shark. Do you remember what kind of eel and what kind of shark? Well, they were just black eels off right. in Lake Oswego uh, near Watertown. When I was a kid, we'd go during the summer to this cab, you know, this small cabin that my parents' friends had. And ro Craigie Rocks, I'd go down on fish for eels. Nobody wanted to eat them but me. It was kind of uh, tin drumish. 
Sharks, that was mm-hmm. off the Florida coast somewhere. I do not remember, but you know my feelings about sharks. First of all, I love sharks. I would love to pet a shark's nose, swim on top of a shark. All right. At one point, sharks were the only thing I feared besides alien alien abduction that already happened. So no biggie. <laughs> but I thought I would eat shark so that if a shark bit me, they would know I was one of them. And it's worked so far. Mako shark is like swordfish. It's delicious. Not only are sharks delicious. Why do I love them, Tim? They like you or like I are the ultimate killing machines. <laughs> this is the Lydian spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, episode 87. We have Gary Lipman coming at ya. <laughs> Here's a story I wrote inspired by a uh, bit of graffiti I saw, actually a graffito I saw in St. Petersburg, Russia, over a toilet in a bar. Somebody had written in English the following phrase, trapped, question mark, masturbate, exclamation point, which I thought was a good little guide for life. And I wrote this story as a result. The story is called in Spanish, El Procoso Masturbator. When we hit a mighty iceberg and our less than mighty ship went down, the blues singer sang a happy church hymn. The deist smashed his wristwatch and dumped the pieces overboard. The anti-Semite blamed guess who for the poor navigation, while the ship's captain hastened to cover up his cock up, fearing the inevitable lawsuits. The anarchist shot the ship's cook with a derringer, though he'd been aiming for the captain. Some soldiers on board sang, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, with only a few of them being out of tune. The politician campaigned for two places on the one of the 18 lifeboats while the new ageist plugged his asshole with a crystal. The misogynist blamed guess who for the politician's typical behavior and the ship's orchestra struck up Hello Dolly, never having learned to play Nearer My God to Thee and having no sheet music for it anyway. The utilitarian tried using the cook's corpse as a makeshift flotation device, while five businesswomen and three businessmen clashed over the right to buy the iceberg. The painter rolled up and crammed her life's work into an empty bottle of cold duck. The environmentalist blamed the ship for damaging this particular patch of ocean while the anti-environmentalist cried, you see, if global warming really did exist, that iceberg would have already melted. The racist finally blamed no one but himself for most things, while the rabbi, the priest, and the imam huddled together, thereby becoming fodder for some jokes the anarchist muttered. The hedonist fucked the closest hole at hand which was the nasty sucking chest wound in the cook's corpse. The normal passengers thought of perverse things while the perverts thought of even more than usually perverse things. One agnostic finally decided what was what while the other remained, quote, not quite sure. Joyce Carol Oates remained in her cabin, hurrying to finish her next book The dope enthusiast sang, praise the Lord and pass the amyl nitrate while he rifled through his neighbor's medicine cabinet. And all the while I stood on deck, just watching everything come rattling down. Finally, finally able to let go and masturbating like a fiend. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, And my friend Gary Lippman, man of many hats, although he's not wearing one right now. 
collage artist, photographer, journalist, author, interviewer. His last published book was Set the Control for the Heart of Sharon Tate, a surreal, absurd, humorous take on Hollywood obsession with stars dead or alive against the also ridiculous Los Angeles backdrop. Welcome, Gary Lippman. Thank you, Lydia and Tim. Good to be here. So tell us a little bit about uh, the Sharon Tate book, and we'll go on to other things from there, but a very interesting concept and very a very strange manifestation of obsession. Just give us a little insight into, into what drove you to write this Sharon Tate book. Most people concentrate on Manson and what it's about. Well, it's about a guy in uh, about 10, 15 years ago, I said it in the past, recent past, who's been almost all his life stone obsessed with Sharon Tate, in love with her, wants to be her. He's writing a book in her voice, which he calls a memoir from beyond the grave. He's um, a, a Sharon Tate obsessive who fancies himself, his own term for himself is he's a Sharonophile. Ah. And as soon as I hatched the idea, which I can tell you about how I came up with the idea, but as soon as I hatched it, I thought, where's the story here, aside from just this weird dude? And then I thought, ah, of course, he runs into and gets involved with people who are equally obsessed, but with Charles ah. Manson. So it's a bad cultural match, and it turns out to be a bad match in every other way for this cat. So I was inspired by some of Polanski's films. And of course, Polanski was Sharon Tate's husband. Roman Polanski did some films uh, in a vein I'd call Paranoia Exquisite. Oh, some of my favorite films, Repulsion, Cul-de-sac, right. Knife and right. Water, The Tenant, the Bitter tenant. Moon even. I right. mean, I refer to my upstairs neighbor, the Trundler, as I sometimes feel like I am the tenant <laughs> just because at 2.30 in the morning, 3.30, he keeps the same hours as I do, 7 a.m. He's trundling. Now, he's lived there for 40 years. He might be a hoarder. He could be moving mm -hmm. furniture. I'm just like, when does the fucking trundler go to sleep? He's, he's as bad as I am. He, just, he never sleeps. But I don't, I don't trundle. I walk on cat feet. You know, it's little known that Polanski was going to do a sequel to The Tenant called The Trundler. What? What? Oh. Just kidding. Ah, Gary. But I love that. You got video. us. Though, I, though may your trundler eventually trip and fall and be laid up somehow. Not this is, no, but this is the problem. He already did, and that's why he trundles on a three-legged walker. Ah, uh, so it's an extra leg for the trundling <laughs> now. That's worse. <laughs> Well, look, if anybody yeah. wants to trundle on their extra leg, I hope it's not so long it reaches the floor because they just have to be sent home immediately. Oh, boy. <laughs> a whole different kind of trundling. Oh, <laughs> well, may your trundler stop trundling however that happens. I don't want to commit the same crime as the tenant, but by I wouldn't even say proxy, out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Anybody who hasn't seen the tenant among mm. our listeners, should rush out and see that. It's kind of the apotheosis of that vein of Polanski that you mentioned, the repulsion, cul-de-sac, even Rosemary's Baby. You know, oh. he's like a master paranoia guy. And the tenant just goes deep, deep into that. And that was probably, if there was one film or book or anything that inspired me, it was a tenant for that creepy, comic, perverse vibe. Well, and paranoid to true because everyone in the building was kind of after mm -hmm. him. And yeah. one of my favorite actresses, Shelley Winters. Oh yeah, Shelley Winters. Amazing. And I don't know, Gary, if you ever saw The Balcony, the film version with Shelley Winters, Leonard um, Nier. No, I never saw that. Peter Falk. And it was about, based on The Balcony by Genet, set in a, a brothel during a revolution, possibly the French or not, and Shelley Winters is running the brothel, and it's amazingly weird. I think you'd now, like it. You had me at Shelley Winters and Leonard <laughs> Nimoy in a Genet play. Oh, again. boy. <laughs> Let's just talk about Leonard Nimoy for one second. I'm sure you know, as a multimedia artist, that in his later years, Leonard Nimoy did photographs of morbidly obese what? women. What? I didn't know that. Yes. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. and, and really quite uh, Nimoy or Shatner. That's the question. <laughs> well, ex excuse me, but his version of Rocket Man is a high point. <laughs> Does anyone here know, was, was that his idea or did someone approach him to do these kind of spoken word covers, Al? I, I, whose idea it was It started that? back a little, either at the time of Star Trek or right after, because that first album, The Transform Man, <laughs> wasn't that what it was called, The Transform? I, I think yeah, so. Yeah, it, it was I, I, like where he does Dylan, like, I forgot, I think he does The Times They Are Changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's what a so style, weird, I it? must say. I took nothing from him, but no, but I mean, who could take anything from his delivery? He was absolutely, truly weird. Oh, yeah. And the rumor is he murdered his wife, like she was she found dead in the bottom of a yeah. pool. But you know, this is where I get a little perverted in my bad entertainment fetish. I've revisited TJ Hooker, Aaron Spelling, great stuff. He's like, Bloated and Aaron Spelling makes him wear these skin tight clothes and he's like doing like log rolls in his cow a cop outfit down hills, like doing his own action scenes. It's like hilarious. Uh, okay, spe so speaking about funny. well, films, <laughs> TV, let's go to literature for a minute because Gary, you had the incredible opportunity to befriend one of my favorite authors and yours, Harry Cruz, and which I named one of my bands after, and all of the songs in the band were named after books by Harry Cruz. My favorite being a childhood biography of a place, gospel singer, car, body, just an incredible, badass, hard-drinking, drug-taking redneck. How'd that happen? He called himself, he didn't like the term redneck, he preferred grit. He called himself a grit. Ah. I met Harry Cruz. You know, Lydia, I think I owe it to you in a way, because when what? I was a kid, <laughs> I came across this record on the shelf in the record on a, in the rack in this record store, probably 86, 87. Does that sound right? Yeah, I don't know. Sure. Band called Harry Cruz with you looking beautiful on the back. No, on the front cover, you were there. Harry's face on the back cover. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody had a face like Harry Cruz. I mean, badass doesn't even begin to cover just a peek <laughs> at his at his mug. So I thought, who the fuck is this guy? I've never seen anybody look in the band. It kind of looked like a Sharpe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I've never heard that. I think you're right. He looked like a Sharpe raised in the swamps of southern Georgia. Not just any sharp head. So yes, you, you got the album. You saw his face. You had to album. meet the man. I saw his face. <laughs> well, what happened was I met first. There was a gatekeeper. I met a cat, also a good writer, not as much of a a, a, a long runner as Harry Cruz, but a great writer too, named Larry Brown. Oh yes, yes. Really cool guy. Very very intense writing. Very spare prose, and I got friendly with Larry Brown and when we got talking about writing, he told me Harry Cruz was his mentor, that they were friends. So he was telling me, you know, Cruz has a reputation as this Ernest Hemingway on acid with a black belt in karate, right? <laughs> who could resist? Right, who could resist? And I said, you know, is he actually good mentor material? Like he's not <laughs> just beating the shit out of you when you put the verb in the wrong place. And he said, Larry said, no, he's the sweetest guy. He's a Southern gentleman. So I thought, ah, I filed that away in mind, right? And about a year later, I was living in Miami Beach back in 92. And I see Harry Cruz is doing a reading in Miami. So Unbelievable, went, wow. He had just, he showed up. I didn't realize he was what he would call a crip. He had a very damaged leg. He walked yeah. with a really pronounced limp. A lot Which of pain, a lot, lot of pain, Harry Cruz. Oh, he had it from a motorcycle accident and bar fights he was in. Oh, boy. He was in oh so boy. many bar fights, in and out of jail, in and out of heroin addiction. And, and wrote so many books, but the thing is, he wrote a lot of books. I mean, wrote about 20 books. He was very prolific because yeah. he had an intense passion for life, but it was matched by his passion for making art. And I used to visit him and stay with him for long weekends. He'd be up in the morning at the typewriter. He never used a computer. He'd clatter away at the typewriter. Didn't get up at like three o'clock in the morning quite often. This is yeah, one of the rumors yeah. about him, which I love. He was also, I was staying with him once and he was telling me all about the Gainesville serial killer. 
Danny yeah. Rollins. Yeah. Mm. Danny Rollins did a lot of uh, sorority girls. Yeah. Tom yeah, Petty. Was, you know how perverse <laughs> you and I are? I was going to say Tom Petty. <laughs> it was a serial oh, lover. Know. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Back, to, back to the story. So, so Cruz, you, Cruz tells me that he, um, he was already very, he was practically bedridden at this point, really at the end of the line. And I was staying with him for a few nights in his guest bedroom. And right before I went to bed, he told me about this Gainesville serial killer and told me, even then, man, I never, never lock my doors. I keep my fucking doors unlocked. They want to come and get me, let them get me. So I thought when I went to bed oh that night, because he spooked me with this story, I thought, <laughs> Harry may not lock the front door, but I'm going to fucking lock my bedroom door just in case, because he really put the fear in me. Because he said, there's so many people even now crawling around Gainesville. You know, I've had people walk in here and I have to chase them out. So I just happened to lock the door that night. Middle of the night, I'm woken up by someone trying to handle the doorknob on my door. No right? shit. The rattler <laughs> rattling you know, the doorknob. Right. It's it's a it's an experience. I think in life it's good to have a lot of different experiences. That's not one that I look to to have again where you sit up and somebody's trying the doorknob in your room. So I yelled out, Harry, no answer. Harry, Harry, no answer. Finally, it stopped. Next morning, I said, what was that about, Harry? Was that you? And he said, oh, yeah, man, I sleepwalk. That may not be true, because he had told me at the end of his life he was pretty horny and said at one point, <laughs> I'll fuck anything with a hole, right? Oh, man. Jesus. So I thought, was this Harry coming to oh, be no. romantic with me in the middle of the night, right? So he gave me a book of his, which I highly <laughs> recommend, a book of essays called Blood and Grits. That's great. Actually, no, Blood and Grits is a great collection of essays, but actually, no, it was a childhood, the memoir that you mentioned. My favorite. Uh, I mean, right. and just the story about him falling into a burning, falling into a vat of boiling water where they right. would skin the pigs as a right. child. Yeah. My great aunt, who I never knew, uh, my grandmother's sister, she had 11 uh, brothers and sisters, died by falling into a vat of boiling water that they were using to, to uh, clean white fabric. They, they used to boil like white clothes. Six-year-old helping the family cook like Harry a lobster lived. instantly. Harry lived, but in that in that memoir, he talks about how the skin came off him, like in in waves of skin, like melting melting oh. off him. He survived more than you can imagine. I remember one time. Oh, but so the finish of the story is: I bring home the book he gives me, his memoir, and I find that night I'm reading it. I find there's a whole bit about how since childhood. He's been sleepwalking. All right. So what, what do you want to believe? Do you believe he was on a, you think he was on a sleepwalking horny uh, adventure? Or do you think he was I, I think, just horny and going after you? Or he was just sleepwalking? You know, what, Tim, what think I think one of the beauties of life <laughs> is that there are so many mysteries <laughs> we're never going to find answers yeah. to, even, even up to when we die. It's going to have to remain an enigma. You know, I haven't had too many lovers that fell asleep on the job, but if they start sleep sexing me, <laughs> they're going to be sorry. I don't think with you that's a problem, Lydia. Well, first of all, I never sleep, so at least one of us will be awake. But you had also told me a story, mm -hmm. Gary, about running into possibly being in a park and seeing who you thought was Jeffrey Dahmer walk by. Oh, yeah. Were you living in Wisconsin? No, I was living in Chicago, and I had a girlfriend I'm still in touch with who was often consulted by the police because she was psychic. She had what she didn't like the term psychic. She called it her intuition. And she would have incredible, I, I became a believer. Wait, can can yeah. I cut you off here? What are the stats? Because I know cops uh, turn to psychics fairly regularly when they really can't find any leads on something that's a, a, maybe a really bad crime. There must be scientific stats that justify this because they, they, it continues to happen. Do you know the I stats? I don't know. I don't How know. Accurate? I only met one cop who consulted her once in Chicago. They would call her. She didn't go into the station. They would mention stuff. I don't think she was able to help them a lot, but she did blow my mind with a case because 
I'm actually, Lydia, I don't know if you even know this, I actually am a criminal lawyer. Well, we're going to get into that in a minute. Okay, yeah. yeah. But, but so, back so to the Dahmer, I, back to the well, Dahmer to incident. Dahmer. So <laughs> she had a psychic thing going on. Her intuition was strong. And I remember the first time I started believing in it was mm. we were living together in Chicago and I came back to New York where I'm from and had an, a, a one night stand with a redhead. <laughs> The next morning when I came in my apartment, the phone's ringing, I pick it up and she goes, you fucked a redhead. So Whoa. I became a believer immediately then. <laughs> there was no other, this was pre-internet, pre-cell phones, pre- You don't think she was, you don't think she was a plant? <laughs> Talk about paranoia, Tim. Now you're raising my Polanski <laughs> level paranoia. Anyway, she and I took a walk in Lincoln Park one night and actually we were gonna have a picnic. And there was even a thought of having picnic under the moonlight picnic with fornication was kind of on the program mm -hmm. as well. We thought, yeah, no, it, it, wait, Gary, you were going to have a dick, Nick. <laughs> I was born in Lincoln Park. actually. That's a on a park story. bench. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Webster and Fremont. Oh, wow. Uh, but anyhow, uh, this, yeah, this yeah, was up by Fullerton. If I'm ever in Chicago, Lydia, okay. when you guys are on tour, I'll bring you to where this happened in Lincoln Park. So, Do you live in Chicago now? No, 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 Chicago, no. Well, Gary, yeah, you might right. take me to okay, the park, okay. but we're not having a dick, Nick, honey. I'm just saying right now, <laughs> I got to give you got to give you something to dream for. Lydia, oh, the boy. pandemic has made all of us really crazy and we rethink our priorities. You may change yeah. your mind. That's why they make vibrators, honey. <laughs> Carry oh, on. Anyway, all right, we're, we're, we're digressing. I want to hear this. We get out of the car, I park my car on a one way road that snakes through the park. Tim, you may know that if I recall, it was one way, you know, going through the park and we pull over on the right side of the road, get out with a bottle of wine, a blanket. I notice a tall-ish, sandy haired guy in shirt sleeves, right? Like an Oxford shirt, sitting alone on a bench. Oh, I boy. Walk with her, we notice him, we walk. Then we realize we forgot something in the car. I think actually we forgot the wine. We go back for the wine, pick it up. I notice the guy is gone. He's not on the bench anymore. There were very few people. It was kind of twilight in, I believe it was, it was summer beginning of 91, like May or June of 91. We pick up the wine, we go walking. And suddenly as we're getting deep into the park, my then girlfriend turned to me and said, shit, and looked around really disturbed and said, someone's following us. Oh boy. I look around, it's getting dark. I don't see anybody. She's very disturbed, but we decide to trudge on. So we <laughs> go further in. She's really very uncomfortable. She keeps turning around and looking. We don't see anyone. We reach a glade. Nobody's around. I put down the blanket and just then she cries out, there he is. And I look and about 50 feet away, <laughs> circling us, which was creepy, not walking at us, not walking away, <laughs> but walking in a circle around us was the same guy. I recognized him from the park bench. So I realized he had followed us and probably hid behind a tree or ducked away whenever we look back. At that point, I got really pissed. So I thought, fuck him following us. So I start thinking the best off defense is an offense, right? And right. being angry, I walk toward him. He doesn't mm -hmm. stop, but he continues to circle around us. And then he gets to like this sort of tunnel, like a walking, a place to walk under. Yeah, like yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. You know may that. know it, yeah. Tim. Yeah. It was yeah. dark in the tunnel. This little walking tunnel, like you see in Central Park. It's like a, 70, a 70s exactly. thriller already. A 70s, so this is, I prefer watching 70s thrillers on the screen. <laughs> and starring in one. <laughs> so he, he walks over to the edge of the tunnel, to the lip of the tunnel. And by the way, recently, about two, three years ago, this ex-girlfriend and I reunited with friends and we told the story together and all of the details matched. 30 years later, she remembered it exactly as I did. Anyway, he gets to this guy, gets to the edge of the tunnel, and then looks at me and waves his hand as if, come on in, let's go in here. 
Whoa. At which point I stopped and suddenly my my uh, strategy, the best defense is an offense, flipped to the best <laughs> offense. It was wrong. I was very vividly <laughs> stopping short as I was walking. All the anger drained out of me and the fear began. Right? Oh, so wow. I backed away from him over to her. And by now, my girlfriend, Tammy, her name was Tammy, was really crying and hysterical and said, he's a killer. He's a killer. Don't go near him. I assume when I heard killer and saw his behavior, I thought he was trying to rape her, right? And she said right then, he's not after me, he's after you, (laughs) right? So- That's our our Jeffrey. Oh Oh my. Wow. We backed up to the main road, that road that our car was on, though we'd walked quarter of a mile down into the park, maybe less than that. But I thought, if we're gonna go back to our car, let's do it by the road with the street lights, you know? We yeah. kept watching him as we backed away and suddenly, and this was also creepy, he broke into a frantic run back the way we had come, right? He what? just started running back the way we had come. <laughs> so oh my God. we walk along, she's hysterical and she said, and I quote, he's not from here. He comes from another city, but he comes to Chicago to hunt. What? That's what she said. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, where, where he, because he, he mostly played on Milwaukee gay bars. I know he was from Milwaukee. Jeffrey Dahmer was from Milwaukee. Of course, nobody had heard of Jeffrey Dahmer by then, right? He, he was not arrested yet or on anybody's radar. So I've since, in reading about Dahmer, I'd hear that he'd come to Chicago to meet guys. I haven't delved into, partly because it's so creepy, whether, you know, and I had enough with Manson, right, researching my Sharon Tate book. I only had room for one serial killer in my life (laughs) at the time. Well, let me tell you back, when we were walking back along the road, she was really upset. I couldn't calm her down. We get to our car. No, he's not around. He's not on the bench. He's not anywhere in the vicinity. We get in the car and I remember doing the corniest little kid thing, but I actually did it. When we got in the car, I looked in the back seat, like I looked all around to make sure he wasn't hiding in the back. We get in the car, I begin, I start the engine and I'm about to pull out. I am pulling out in fact, I hit the brake and looked in the rear view and I see about five cars behind us on the road another car has, without its headlights on, begun to pull out of its parking spot. And it dawned on me then that he was gonna follow us home, know where we lived, right? Which is what you never wanna have happen. (laughs) So in a rage, I pulled out and then suddenly the best defense is an offense again. I'm very brave when I'm in my car, right? Able to lock the doors. So I hit, <laughs> I went reversed back toward him and I was driving fast, you know, so you're all over the place in reverse. He pulled forward and he pulled right next to me and stopped. I stopped. Tammy and I both look, our window is closed, his window is closed, but I can still picture this face contorted, screaming something at us, right? I couldn't hear him, but I just see the face contorted. It was only about two yeah, seconds gross. of him yelling. Then he hit the gas and drove super, super fast away. I started chasing him to get his plates, right? But I could not go as fast as he, he was flooring it. And it was crazy to try and chase him. You know, I would have, I would have wrapped the car around a tree. Gary, I think what he was screaming was I want your brain. <laughs> well, you, you said there was 91 this or 92? Was May or June, I think maybe late May or early June, maybe early June of 91. Uh, let me tell you the moral of this story. The moral is fear is a very good indicator of tr- uh, you should trust it. When the hair on the back of your neck stands up, if you think it's an intuition, if you have a gut feeling, Go with it immediately because you're not going to lose anything by doing that. And yeah, the best defense, get the hell out of there or you better have a bigger knife. 
than Jeffrey Dahmer. Not only a bigger knife, Lydia, but a killer instinct, right? Well, you don't have to question me about that, honey. Right. <laughs> So, so the reason I asked it was 91 or 92, because like 92, there was close to a thousand homicides in Chicago. I mean, Chicago was so bloody in the early 90s. It was mostly gang right. stuff. And I'm just, you know, I'm just picturing the whole backdrop. It was so fucking rough back then. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know. I, I was, you know, that park, I, one of my high school gigs uh, was selling ice cream in, in Lincoln Park in 92. And the amount of propositions by fucking pedophile fucking predators that I would get all the time. It's just like creepsville in that fucking place. Like every day. It was like, what the fuck's going on here? Are you, are you a uh, defense or prosecution? Uh, I, I worked for the innocence project. Cause you know, there's a lot of innocent people in prisons. Oh, so don't get me started. It, it is, yeah. it is a, it's a Holocaust. You know, Gary, when I first started doing spoken word uh, performances about prison, there were only 900,000 people in U.S. prisons. That was under Clinton. Now we're up to what? Almost three million. Yeah. And America does have more prisoners than Russia, China. I had a big stick up my behind about prison for a while, I have to say, because this is ridiculous and it's such an important thing for people like you who are articulate, arty and weird and understand that so many people are innocent or over committed to an institution that does nothing for, for them. Right. Please tell right. us some more, my friend. Well, I got into that work. Actually, I was living in Chicago because I went to Northwestern University Law School. So I may have, while I was a student, may have bought, what were you selling, Tim, in Lincoln Park? Ice, ice cream. cream. I may ice have bought cream. ice cream from you back then. <laughs> may, Who knows? I may have. Yeah, at That'd least it was. If it was me, at least it was me and not Jeffrey Dahmer buying I, it. From. I, I, I was literally at the you know the walk bridge to the beach at Fullerton uh, that crosses to yeah. you know j just a little south of the zoo. Um, that's okay, where Gary. My Gary, one, was. What, Gary, one question. What yeah. flavor? What flavor? <laughs> you know what I'm perversely into now. A lot of things. A lot of things, but when it comes to ice cream, mint chocolate chip. Some people, <laughs> some people hate it. Some people hate it. Let me cut cut in here, you you kindergarten connoisseurs. <laughs> Somebody introduced me recently to high vanilla bean with a tiny bit of olive oil and black pepper. Ooh. Uh, All right, let's go, let's go back that's to some artisan stuff. Yeah, well, you know what? Excuse to. me. I just got the Hannibal cookbook and I plan on practicing some recipes on you. We'll get into that later. Gary, Lydia go. Lunch, artist of the people with a very particular elitist ice cream taste. Gary, you but, know, as I said earlier, I like the first lick. I'm a nibbler. <laughs> One point, Gary. Yes. Selling ice cream in the park, the yuppie thing they were selling was Dove bars at the time, which, which was like already oh, yeah. $4, for, $4 for one. Yeah. I was living in Bucktown with my dad and the Mexican 50 cent, whether there's the water base or the milk base. And they were like 10 times better than the garbage. I was uh, uh, OK, C cut with the fucking ice cream now. Let's get <laughs> back to the important issues. You went to law school, which was a big thing to decide anyway, as somebody yeah. who was who was into art, into writing, into literature and weird and into music. What made you at first even decide? Was it just a social conscious, a commitment? And you're in Chicago. Which right. is, of course, well, Chicago was great. You know, the, the reason it's a great question, Lydia, I never really, although I always was digging criminal law and reading about criminal law and crime and crime books of all sorts, I never thought law would be anything I'd be into except, and here's something about being an artist, being a writer, musician, so much of it depends on self confidence and will, right? And back when I was finished with college and floating around doing weird jobs, I didn't have enough self-confidence to just go out and write for a living, win, lose, or draw. And so I had a girlfriend at the time who said, well, you're into criminal law and criminal stuff. Why criminal mindsets. Become, uh, right, and mindsets. Why don't you become a lawyer? You could do that and then write about that shit. And... It was this a like, psychic? Was the psychic the one that told you this? No, no, no. The psychic <laughs> came later. I met the psychic right around then. By the way, with the psychic, she and I, just to conclude, because I think this is a key part of that Jeffrey Dahmer story, not to bring Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, you know, it could have been another serial killer. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. About a month or two later, 
I had moved to Vermont and she and Whoa. I broke up, but we stayed in touch. Is this a Ted Bundy uh, connection now? No, no. I opened, <laughs> I opened a newspaper. I think it was the New York Times up in Vermont. And I read about a serial killer who's just been busted in Milwaukee. Okay. And I remember number. reading about him. There was no picture. But then the next day that we saw mm -hmm. our first picture of Jeffrey Dahmer, I looked at it and thought, uh-huh, okay. Doesn't look like a lot of serial killers, you know, tall, pretty good looking blonde guy. And then I did a double take and thought, that's the fucker from the park. No fucking way. And uh, Gary, I called, have you, uh, no. Gary, have you ever heard about the smiley face murders? No. Okay, well about 335 frat boys over many states, and I think there's multiple killers, have been disappearing. And happy face drawings are then demarked on the trees. And they usually end up in a body of water, a creek, a lake, a, a river, uh, a pond. But because it's spread out over so many different states, as you know, the, sorry, the wise serial killer does, they still haven't uncovered who's doing this, I don't think. You know, Lydia, it's funny you mention that. I hadn't heard about the smiley faces, but back in the 90s or the early 2000s, I read, because I read the paper every day, kind of, kind of obsessively, and I would read Copy about- Copy that, me too, many yeah. papers, go ahead. And I'd, I'd read about these killings of young men, often good looking men, found in bodies of water. And I remember thinking, New York has a serial killer, but I didn't realize it was nationwide nationwide spread mm. out over the country. I, I, there's some good articles on online about that. So you still continue to work with the Innocent uh, Innocence Project. Right. Yeah, I got into that. I had a lawyer who was a mentor. I mean, a, a law professor who was a mentor. And when I finished law school, I decided, you know what, I'm going to take time just to write. So I began writing in earnest, but then I got pulled into it part time by a mentor, former law professor, who was defending a guy in Chicago on death row, a guy named Rolando Cruz, who this was now 92, 91, 92. Rolando Cruz was on death row for killing a little girl, raping and murdering, and then disposing the body of a little girl. The real killer said to the feds, if you guys who was all the real killer was also on death row and said to the feds, mm. if you take me off death row and just give me life, I'll tell you about another killing I did that you don't know I did. And you've got the wrong guy in prison for. So they said, OK, we're going to listen to your statement hypothetically. Right. He would say, if I did do it, it was so he's not admitting guilt directly. They took it, realized that what he told them conformed with the facts of this child rape murder that Rolando Cruz was innocently serving a death sentence for, but they didn't want to admit it because cops Man. had perjured yeah, right. themselves to put Rolando Cruz in prison. Yep. Rolando Cruz was a gangbanger from Chicago, a mm. tough kid, and he was fucking around with the cops telling them, you know, he would keep his ears open and when they couldn't find the killer, they ended up just saying, you know what, let's pop Rolando for this. You know, uh, Chicago PD, I remember when my dad uh, bought these buildings and bought, we moved to Bucktown and it was still very rough. He was doing something to clean, clean up the neighborhood and he was basically painting over all this uh, graffiti. And there was this tag everywhere called Rabbit. And, and my brother and I are like, what's this Rabbit guy? He's like, oh yeah, this is, he was basically an informant, like gangbanger, old school style they called him rabbit because the cops knocked his two front teeth in. he was like a reverse rabbit and then and then one you know i don't know he just the cops decided you know what we're done with this guy and they took him in the fucking alleyway and they fucking murdered him they just like you know old school this is like 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 early 80s they just killed yeah. him in the alley it, it, it's so fucking insane yeah i had a scary thing happen with the chicago cops in the middle of the night totally unprovoked at my house Minding my own business about two o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on my back door. Open it's you know, Chicago cop and fucking leather coat. And he goes, uh, excuse me, is this like, you know, the church of so-and-so? And I go, you know, it's not the church of so-and-so. This is an apartment building. The church is, you know, two blocks away. 
he goes, uh, well, an alarm went off. And I go, there, there is no alarm in this <laughs> thing. And he's standing there and he goes, what, what are you doing? And I was like, well, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm, I'm in my apartment. And he goes, this is the strangest part. He goes, go to bed. <laughs> I was in bed. And, and I got so mad. Kind of, I guess it was similar thing. Best uh, defense is a good offense. I was like, what do you mean go to bed? It's my house. I, you can't tell me to go to bed. Simon hates to be told go to bed. And as a matter of fact, yeah. we around here oh, at the boy. Lydian Spin do share the do share the occasional Simon go to bed. He doesn't like it. <laughs> All right. Well, now, uh, you know what? I sent you my article, Gary, assume the position. You know that my relationship with the police is completely different because I'm more <laughs> subversive. We're not going to go into that right now. It's so important what you do, though, to defend. I mean, your job will never be finished in defending innocent people and that we have more prisoners than Russia or China. I mean, this country is out of control on so many levels. It's, it's largely due, Lydia, to prosecutorial misconduct and cop misconduct. But there are cases where there are just mistakes made. And I had right. a lot of cases. One still haunts me where even though I delve deep, deep into it, I still cannot say if our client was guilty or innocent. It was so evenly pitched and such a complicated case. So imagine a jury who are right. less sophisticated than me as a, a lawyer looking at that. I did it for many years. I mainly did it part-time at the Innocence Project, but I saw so many just absolutely heartbreaking cases of people spending decades in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Uh, it's and, and so part, brutal. part of the problem is this guilty or innocent. The American prison system is fucked to the fucking core. It's like there is no more rehabilitation. There's no education. There are private gulags. They're just lock them up for as long as possible. And it's ridiculous. I'm just thinking about, for instance, the prison system in Spain where maximum 10 years for anything and that we still at Trump won firing squad. What what century are we in here? Right. I mean, yep. who justifies the fact that you kill a killer? And also forget about the killing for a minute. Most crime in general is because of what? Poverty. Right. And there's so many poor people in this country. So un we don't even know the statistics. I, I think that at least at this point, more than 50 percent of America is living below the poverty, you know, but by, below the poverty standards. Nobody, unless you're really twisted, wakes up in the morning going, yeah, I'd really like to uh, snatch granny's bag today because I'm bored. It's like most crime is committed out of desperation or unfortunately in the inner city, disrespect, which is ridiculous. You're right, Lydia. You, you know what I would add to that? Very dysfunctional family backgrounds. Oh, fuck clearly. People up. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, if you, if you start off on a bad foot, it's really hard yeah. to turn that around. You and again, what? once people go into prison, they they don't have any they're not given tool. They should be given tools to help readjust, to have some kind of education well, and, and guidance. And they don't. And this is the, we have gulags at the same time. At the same time, Lydia, because I went to UMass Amherst and Massachusetts has like this progressive program that if you start a uh, higher education degree, you can maybe get out of prison a little early and. My neighbor was an ex-con, and and uh, even though you know, I, I believe I'm a progressive person with these policies. That motherfucker was terrifying. Like, I mean, some you know, you know, you know what? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Back to this issue: three million people in prison. That's that's the ones. That, yeah, I laugh all you want. Three million people in prison. That means how many others are being affected by the person that is incarcerated? Uh, right. millions upon millions and right. six million on parole excuse me six million on parole yes there are some terrifying motherfuckers out there and a few of them are in the uh, on pennsylvania avenue that's the big turn the white house into the big house and this is an issue that bugs i don't know why i've never been arrested you know why i'm a better criminal than most enough said gary i, I have one question do you do you know uh murray richmond fix it in a hurry murray no it, you, oh yeah the new york post called him the best criminal defense lawyer in, in New York, he, he, he defends like mobsters and whatever. He, he, his classic case is that he convinced the jury that you got to murder off the hook by saying the victim fell backwards into his knife. Okay, but, but, all but, right. But, no, 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 hold on. This is the point. There's two courts in America. Criminal one for black people and a civil one for white people is essentially oh, yeah. what it comes down oh, to. That, great, great yeah. point made. Yeah, Your job will never be done. 
scary. They will always be more cases than you can ever handle. So how do you balance that between your artistic designs and your need for whatever you can do about social justice? How does that you know, work? Well, first of all, I, don't, I haven't worked there for a while, but I was there for a long time. And uh, I hope to go back someday. I really miss it. But I decided to devote myself full time to writing. Well, have you ever thought of maybe teaching writing classes in prison? Which, you know, you know I, how many interesting stories are there within law? I think that would be amazing. I haven't ever thought of teaching, but if I did teach, I think that'd be the, the place to go because we've got enough kids and kids who are entitled and who are really comfortable can go to college to learn writing. But to teach Excuse in prison. Excuse me. Would and be you know amazing. what? Go to college to learn writing. Right. Get a life and learn to write about uh -huh. it. I'm not so sure. But look, it's very important that people tell their stories directly. And the thing is, a pencil and a piece of paper, almost anybody can afford. I've taught workshops for homeless kids in LA before because their stories need to be told. They mm -hmm. need to be told. Absolutely. And you know what I say, Lydia? One thing that helped me starting out writing when I was beginning to get too metaphorical and fancy and tripped all <laughs> over myself with the language, what I realized was I'm not a poet, I'm a prose writer. And if you, and I heard somebody say this and I took it to heart, if you can tell a story in a bar or tell a story across a jail cell or tell a story on a bus, then you can write it. You just need what you said, the pencil and paper, because people don't want, they're reading they want to be told a story. They don't need the fancy language. It's cool. It helps sell the story. It, but it's it's also why I think spoken word is still important. And it's also when I teach writing with spoken word workshops, not everybody can tell a good story. Not everybody can write one. Sometimes you might have to just tell a friend, a record, then edit. Everybody right. could tell a great story. Yeah. Not everybody can write one. And by the way, great writers often can't read their stories that good. There's the other conundrum. Just say, yeah. carry on, Tim. Sorry. So, to no, so, so I'm curious when you're saying this, like technically speaking, are you like a fast typer? Is it like a stream of consciousness? That is that how you basically write? It's just pouring out of you? Or do you, you say you're a prose writer and, and you're connected with like telling the story on, on the back of a bus? Or are you actually slowly chipping away word by word? You know, it's funny. Sometimes it comes really slowly and you go word by word. And other times, yesterday, for example, I came up with about a page of prose for an essay I'm writing. And it just, I took a walk and I wrote it in my head, you know, right. as I was walking. It just all came. I rushed back and then wrote it down and fiddled with that because I'm a total rewriter. I'm not yep, Jack Kerouac, know. first thought, best thought. Right. I need, uh, Lydia, are you like that? Do you rewrite uh, a lot? My, my method is this for, for writing, say essays or stories or lyrics. Uh, the muse has to hit whatever that is. The, the subject has to hit. Once the first line comes up, I never edit. I, because I was self-taught in writing for spoken word, my material is already in-camera edited. So a lyric right. will take me 10 minutes, but only when it's ready to come out. And right. sometimes I would write a lot of my speeches in my sleep, like you said, taking a walk, because sometimes you have to get away from, and I did write Paradoxia on a typewriter, just to get back to that, even though I had a computer, because I needed the sound of that for right. that book. But I write in spurts. I don't have unpublished manuscripts. I write when it's necessary, when there's a to topic I have to tackle, when there's a performance I have to do. And pretty much if it's a long story or speech, comes out in three massive blurbs. But I'm disciplined also, I think this is important for writing. You have to choose the time and stick to it. I'm gonna write between nine and 12. I'm gonna write between right. six and nine. Everybody has a different style of writing, like they have a different style of writing music. People like Jerry Stahl write 60 page outlines sometimes. And I'm like, 60 page outlines, that's half the book. What are you talking about? Everybody yeah. has a different style or technique. Right, exactly. You know, I know a novelist, a, a wonderful Iranian American novelist who's a good friend. She can't know what's going to happen next. Uh, her name is Dahlia Sofer, by the way, and wrote, she's written two great novels that I urge everybody to check out. She begins each novel with no idea what's going to happen next, who these characters are, how they're going to behave. And she discovers the story as it unfurls 
you know, in that's on, funny. On An- another <laughs> style of writing, you know, right. and I know I know a few writers that have such immense outlines. They have to storyboard things. That's just their technique. There's no talent. It also depends on what the format is you're going for. Is it an essay? Is it a story? Is it a spoken right. word piece? Is it a lyric, right. et cetera? Do you ever write drunk or fucked up? I mean, when I think when I think of like Joyce being wasted and p- plowing through, so I'm like, yeah. how's that even possible? What's going on? I, I look, a lot a lot of writers are oh, hardcore yeah. alcoholics yeah. because because it's a it's a very lonely occupation. It's lonely, but also when you're drunk or fucked up in in some other way, it loosen you know it obviously loosens inhibitions of all kinds, and for some people. It loosens creative constipation. You know, Since I can never get fucked up enough. Uh, no, I don't write when I'm fucked up or drunk, but that's just <laughs> me because if I'm going to do a piece, if I have a, something to write, I want to do it not as early as Harry Cruz at three o'clock in the morning, but maybe at six or nine o'clock in the morning because I got to get that shit yeah. done. My friend of mine has a theory. He's like, Tim, it's what he said. He goes, Tim, you're too smart to play rock and roll, so you need to be a little drunk to make the dumber choices <laughs> so it makes it better. <laughs> Look, I'm always amazed that somebody as incredibly talented as Tim Dahl plays oh, <laughs> dumb rock in my band. I am so uh, thrilled about that. Tim, I, Tim. I, I, I love playing dumb rock. By the way, yes, so do I. Time, the first time I saw a retrovirus and yeah. your bass, Tim, blew yeah. me away. And I remember the uh, word that came to mind was overdriven. It was so Perfect. overwhelming, the sound of it, in a great way. I appreciate that. Well, it, he makes so- the most of, you know, the simplicity. I mean, yeah, musically, I'm pretty much of a minimalist. And when you're reviewing a whole catalog of my material, Tim brings an over-educated, uh, hyper-awareness of so many other kinds of music that between the notes or between the stupidity, he's got to fit in his vision. And it always matches mine. Well, oh, Gary, so so what one thing Lydia, you know, you have to realize these songs, right? So there's these margins that you have to work <laughs> with to make sure you realize what the song is. And then Lydia basically goes, within those margins, try to get away with murder. So like ba- basically, <laughs> what can you get away with? And yeah. that, that's basically yeah. it. Look, I mean, to, to collaborate with people, it, it, for me, is to give ultimate freedom, is to, I'm not collaborating with somebody to necessarily dictate to them, I'm asking you to bring something else to it. Right. But Lydia, I got to say another thing you mentioned about performing, that not all writers can sell their work verbally in performance, Mm. right? That too, I began reading my stuff aloud when my book came out and I realized that's a whole other art. It's a whole other skill. I remember seeing you and our friend Michael Imperioli perform once and you I'd seen before, but I hadn't seen Mike. I don't think I'd seen Michael, although I knew him and love his book, um, The Perfume Burned His Eyes. But the first time I saw him read from it, I thought, wow, this cat really is selling this prose. And mm. then I remembered, wait, he's an actor. Well, okay. He's a great actor. And again, Gary, when I teach workshops, it's about how you perform. And one of the ways to try to, to, try to do that, because a lot of you might write, but who are you, who are you reading it to? If you got a cat, read it to the cat. You got to read it. You got to record it. Got to hear it. And and I find it very helpful if somebody else reads your material because you go right. deaf or blind to it. And then you can go, oh, now I know what has to right. change. And not that, not that people should read it like I do, but hear, hear what needs to be done. What are you getting at? Are you saying, is this something you're developing? Is learning how to read your own work? Like, yeah, it, it, yeah okay. I've had to. I never did. And in fact, somebody said to me years ago, never publish anything without reading it out loud to yourself, right? Interesting. Even an essay I'll publish online, you know? And I've started doing that. I don't really like doing it, but I've come to recognize how important Well, it is. Gary, if you ever need me to read it to you, honey, I love right. to read shit out loud. Well, well Gary, it's, it's interesting because like, first time I even attempted fin- Finnegan's Wake, I'm like, what the hell's going on? And I'm- well, I'm Wait I'm, a minute, I, boy. No, but the, the thing is- wait. No, hold on, hear me, hear me out, because- I'm actually a slow reader, so, so it's like, I'm like, it kind of doesn't really matter if I don't know what's going on. And when I played it, books on tape on YouTube, I'm like, it's music. I don't give a fuck. This is the most insane thing I've ever fucking heard. It's incredible. 
You know, it's great you mentioned that because Finnegan's Wake, first of all, I have a son who's 20, due to be 23 very soon. You mean the one you brought to my show when he was in Mary uh, Alistair? That was so kind. Lydia. Yes. He, well, he's a rock and roll fan. He knew who you were and loved you back then when he Bring was 16. Bring your sons. Bring your sons. <laughs> As opposed to Lou Reed's song, Kill Your Sons. Bring them to Lydia's shows. <laughs> Which I've covered for years, but I, I no, know, no, I know, no, no. And it's certainly, I'm not going to kill, I'm there to save the sons that have already been killed by their parents in society. Carry on. Here. Well, you certainly inspired my kid. And so much so that He's a very literary kid as well as music, very adept with um, and knowledgeable about great music. So he did his honors thesis at college, his big senior project, writing about Finnegan's Wake. Oh, OK. Wow. And as, All right. any, as our listeners may or may not know, Finnegan's Wake is a Mount Everest of high <laughs> literature and incomprehensible, <laughs> impenetrable without guidebooks to understand, but it's brilliant because what Joyce is doing, it effectively created his own language, right? Which is a melange of literary allusions and other language, European languages and puns. One thing when you dip into that book, Tim, you know, so many puns. I stole a pun from Finnegan's Wake for a play I did once, the title, I used it as a title, which was Paradox Lust. <laughs> exactly. Gary, I, I know one gauge that I'm getting older as a male when dad puns just come out of my mouth and I didn't even intend it. They, they literally just fall out of my mouth. <laughs> a really bad one. I heard the other the other like last year. How do you know when it's a dad pun? When it becomes a parent. Uh, <laughs> all right. Gary. Oh, Tim. Get back to you. Get back to you, Gary. Tie it up, Timmy. Back to you, Gary. <laughs> What are some of your favorite books or authors? I mean, to me, you know, uh, Celine, Selby, Miller, Desaad, Clarice Lispector, Brazilian writer, E.M. Siron. That's my top list, I'd say. What about you? you, you I, I love every writer you just mentioned, except I haven't read Lispector, though I have a copy of her. Um, you know who I'll, who I adore, and I'll tie it back to Harry Cruz. Of course, I did Cruz's writing, but one time I was staying with Harry, and I had with me a book of short stories by Jorge Luis Borges. Oh yes, who's a favorite writer. But I thought because Borges was an Argentinian, sometimes I describe Borges as like writing Twilight Zone stuff for intellectuals. It's very based on paradox and on enigma and really rich stuff. And it's short stories only. He never wrote a novel. He wrote poetry, essays, and short stories. And it's the stories that I really love. But he was a very academic kind of writer. When I was with Harry Cruz once, he was writing and I was reading, staying at his house. And I took out Borges and I was reading it. And Harry looked up from his chair. He used to sit on this big easy chair. He said, what is that? And I said, this is uh, Borges. You ever hear of him? He goes, I heard of him, you know? So I said, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I don't know if it's for you, Harry. He goes, give it here. <laughs> Master. So I hand him the book and he starts looking through it and he goes, you mind if I borrow this? I said, keep it, man, keep it, you know? And then I left. I drove down to Miami from Gainesville. And when I got to Miami, I called him to thank him for his usual hospitality. And I said, uh, how are you, Harry? What's up? And he said, I haven't gotten up. I'm just reading that Borges shit. <laughs> and man, it's good shit. Nice. Mm. He totally got it. Cormac McCarthy, really let's not leave him out. Oh, Cormac McCarthy. I mean, Tennessee Williams, I got to I got to give a plug because just do. so Gary, here, here's a fun fact. I did not realize this. I, I was looking up Andre the Giant. Guess who used to drive him to school in high school every day? Sam Beckett. Ah, when, what? When Sam, when oh, Sam, Lord, I've heard when, that. Sam Where? Beckett, in France. Sam Beckett moved to France. He wrote. He, he would write in French first, and then he'd translate. I back hope to he had a big car. He's like, who's this freak? And Sam Beckett's like, you know, I want to know him, and I'm going to offer him a ride. And he, be, they became like friends, and like he would drop him off at high school every day. I did meet Andre the Giant. 
You did, Lydia? I used to go to Madison Square Garden to watch wrestling with Debbie Harry and Chris Stein. And, and that I met Andre the Giant and I also met him on a plane once. And I have to say, I think I came up to his belly button. <laughs> and his you belly button I, was probably as big as my face. Lydia, me having an encounter, possible encounter, because I've never been able to prove for sure that was Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, yeah. But certainly his behavior was that night, that dude was very Dahmer-like, we'll agree, right? You know, but, you know, I hope, you know, uh, Gary, I hope that was a Jeffrey Dahmer wannabe and you fucking cock blocked him so hard he just gave up on being a serial killer. Yeah, I, I drove him out of the serial killer business, Tim, and therefore <laughs> saved you from an encounter with him the year later. Oh, I want your ice I cream you, on your Tim. brain. But what I was going to say, Lydia, is you meeting Andre the Giant is even cooler than me having my encounter with Dahmer. Well, I want to say me meeting the Road Warriors and writing an article about them, which Spin refused to publish because it was too violent, was better than me meeting Andre the Giant. <laughs> Gary, did you, did you like Gold Dust? Do you remember Gold <laughs> Dust? The, the kind of like black metal tran tranny <laughs> that would like, you'd go to like the middle of like Tennessee and be like, I'm going to turn you into a real man. Everyone's like, boo! Did you know that Tim once had a band of all black metal trannies? It was called the Tim Doll Experience. Oh, no. That's oh, true. God. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tim. You, you, you got me. You got speaking, me. Speaking of down south, Harry Cruz did tell me once that his drug dealers were a, a couple of elderly lesbi German lesbians who drove around the south in a BMW, never got stopped by cops because they were two elderly women, but the trunk of the BMW was filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of hard drugs. What was Harry, what drugs was Harry doing? I mean, the pain, obviously. So what was he taking? He was a junkie for a long time and he told me how he got into it. He was always disdainful of heroin, but he had a girlfriend who was shooting in front of him in his house. And he pointed, she was sitting right where you are now, right? When I was sitting with him. So he said that she and some friends were shooting up and he was grousing and complaining, you know, fucking bullshit, you know. He'd, he'd been an alcoholic and he'd been clean and then back into it, but this never done heroin till these women were shooting up right in front of him. And he said, that's bullshit. And the woman said to him, I remember him telling me this exactly. She said, Okay, well, we're going to go on up to heaven now. <laughs> you stay back and mind the thought. <laughs> well, the last and thing I would want is for Harry Cruz to puke on my shoe. <laughs> well, he used to, somebody I know was in his class. He was a professor of writing at University of Florida in Gainesville. And this, this friend, I haven't seen her in a long time, told me he used to bring in a bucket. And during the class. How did I know? When the hangover came over him, when the, the twirlies came over him, he would just vomit in the bucket and then continue teaching, right? And the kids were just there, that's Harry. But what got him into the heroin, I love this, is they basically peer pressured him because this woman, mm -hmm. this hot young woman he was with, Peer pressure into taking heroin is pretty funny. Well, yeah, look, but look Tim, it, Tim? Tim Dahl, you've tried to peer pressure me into ingesting some things, and I've been, I will never buckle, but go ahead. Certainly never heroin. Never. Wait, you didn't, you didn't hear this line, Lydia, because what, what the woman said to Harry was, okay, we're going up to heaven. You stay back here and mind the farm, farmer. And he said, <laughs> maybe from his upbringing in, you know, the swamps of Okefenokee in southern Georgia, he got pissed at being called a farmer. So he said, I'm no farmer. Give she me said, a yeah, shot. A You're going to watch the farm while we go to heaven. So he said, give me that shit. <laughs> no he way. picked up the gear and that was it. Where he'd shoot up was, he had a tattoo on the crook of his elbow that he wrote about because he actually lived that thing, that great, you know, bohemian cliche. He went out drinking in Alaska woke up the next day and had a tattoo with no idea how he got it. Mm -hmm. It was a door hinge on the crook of his elbow. And he said he used to shoot there. He showed it to me and said he would shoot a lot there. Well, you know what, but kids? Don't try that at home. It's really passe. This has Ugh. been the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Gary Lippman, man of many hats, criminal defense lawyer, collage artist, photographer, journalist, interview expert, writer, author, published in many different places. 
Very good to have you on the show, Gary. It was a pleasure for me, Lydia and Tim. This actually happened to me pretty much as I'm going to describe it here. And this was so therefore this little narrative not only set off the Sharonophilia of my main character, his obsession with Sharon Tate, but it also sort of suggested to me many, many decades after this happened. So this is sort of the, the origin story for the book and as well for my protagonist's obsession. The kid whose lame, name is Lunt has already been, he's a little boy at the time, watching TV in his suburban New Jersey home, flipping the channels. He's already aware of who uh, Sharon Tate is because he's taken peeks at the book Helter Skelter in his local bookstore. So he knows who she is. He knows who Charles Manson is, but he's not thinking much about them when he's watching TV one night and comes across a movie on channel 11. The movie being broadcast that night was The Wrecking Crew a bad late 60s James Bond knockoff. In this flick, an aging turtleneck clad Dean Martin starred as Matt Helm, a hip fashion photographer who moonlighted as a Bond-like secret agent. Against the film's band of villains, what help did Matt Helm have? Only another American spy, one whose cover assignment was as a guide to tourists in Denmark. Newly arrived in Copenhagen, Helm is checking into his hotel when a young woman in tight slacks with pillbox hat and goofy square framed spectacles comes dashing through the lobby. Mr. Helm, oh, Mr. Helm, and promptly does a pratfall, landing flat on her back on top of his luggage. I'm Freya, declares the woman from her prone position, clearly unflappable. Freya Carlson. Lunt blinked at the TV set. Seated alone in his family's living room, the boy felt his heart rate accelerate inside his pajama top. Sweat began to moisten every pore. Wow, there was so much here to savor. Freya's red-toned hair, a wig Lunt would soon learn, her honeyed voice, kind eyes, wide mouth, lustrous skin, and razor cheekbones. Everything about her was delectable. More than anything though, Lunt loved Freya's klutziness. Being a klutz himself, he could identify with this woman and by extension with whatever actress played her. We're the same, he told himself. We're birds of a feather. And with her, only with her, he thought, with this angel of mercy, it seemed okay for him to be a klutz to be uncool, to be himself. It was as though she'd reached through the glass TV screen and right into his home to take Lunt's hand and guide him to the portal of puberty. His bubbling hormones would require more time before he could actually pass through that portal. But while he waited, this actress playing Freya Carlson waited with him and she would not release his hand. He wouldn't let her. He held on tight. Watching the wrecking crew, the boy was incapable of clear thought. He was under the actress's spell, but this spell got shattered an hour later. As soon as the good guys, Helm and Freya, had kicked some serious villain ass, the words, the end, came flashing across the screen. Then the credits rolled, and Dean Martin's name appeared beside Matt Helm, and next to Freya, appeared a name that horrified Lunt once he read it. This name, he recognized it from Helter Skelter. Oh God, he cried out, startling his parents in the kitchen two rooms away. But she's the one, the pregnant actress who that psycho Manson. Yes, 